Hi everyone, welcome to an hour with Lossico. This is Ramanuj Mukherjee from iPleaders and Lossico.com. And with me, I have Nivedita Sain today, who's, a P who's pursuing her PhD in Geneva, and she is also an tra international trade law specialist. A lot of times I have people coming up to me or calling us and asking, I want to be an international lawyer. What do I do? And those are the questions to ask today because we have somebody who is working on international law and can really answer all the questions you have about what you can do uh, in that field. In fact, she even is doing some consultancy projects for uh, international law firm Link Letters. Uh, she, she does certain uh, consultancy work and we'll ask all about that in a bit. But let us first welcome Nivedita. Hi, Nivedita. Welcome. Hi, Ramanuj. Hour. Thank you for having me. Um, so should I start with a bit of background about myself? I graduated uh, from law school in 2013 and my international law uh, interests had developed by then, uh, mostly because of my uh, publications and as well as uh, uh, moot court uh, pursuits in law school. Uh, but I did work in corporate law for a while because it took me a while to be very sure that I, this is a field that I want to be in because it was such a niche field. After a year and a half of working in law firm, I took the plunge. I specialized in international economic law at uh, Cambridge. And since then, I have been in the field of uh, trade law in general. So I did a consultancy first in India. Then I worked uh, at the WTO first. I did an internship and then I was a short term consultant. Subsequently, I started my PhD, which is what I'm still doing right now, and also work as a teaching assistant where I teach courses like global governance uh, and international economic law, where I assist on these courses. And, and I also do a couple of consultancy projects. Great. So, you know, if you can tell us from the beginning, like after you graduated, you said that, uh, you know, you, you went to study at Cambridge, right? Right away? Uh, no, I have worked for a year and a half in, uh, in corporate law. So I worked with a law firm called uh, Argus Partners, uh, which is a law firm. Uh, uh, we, I worked in their Calcutta office. It has multiple offices across India. So I was in corporate law for a while. But my interest in international law, I would say, and specifically international trade law, had developed while I was in law school itself. So at the back of my mind, I always knew that I wanted to pursue this. But I still worked in corporate law for one and a half years, which was a good experience. But then I decided to kind of follow my passion after that. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so basically, uh, a career in international law became possible because you went to Cambridge. Is that correct to say? Uh, yes, I would definitely uh, say so. So international law is a specific field. International trade law is an even more niche field. So even entry level opportunities in this field, which is uh, usually internships, uh, they require internships in international organizations such as the WTO. Uh, they require you to have a master's degree. So I think this is one of uh, the areas where an LLM is required. And again, when it comes, there are a lot of debates about whether one should go for an LLM or not. And I think obviously there are pros and cons for it in some sectors. It is not so useful for for the next step in your career, but in in this case, in the field of international law, I would say that an in, uh, an LLM is a requirement, is a basic requirement. Right. So, uh, how does it work? Like, how do you uh, decide? Like, you know, what what attracted you to international law really? Because it's quite unusual to hear that somebody has chosen a career in international law. And it's supposed to be very hard also and difficult to pursue. So, you know, if you can tell us about what, like what attracted you to this in the first place. Yes. So as I said, my interest in international law, it uh, developed while I was in law school uh, through basically two pursuits, which were, I mean, not my academic programs uh, curriculum as such, but they were through my moot court activities. I did a couple of international law uh, moot courts uh, and uh, as well as uh, a couple of publications that I worked on. So uh, I guess when I was in law school, because I did not have any set idea about what 
I would do. I explored a lot of different areas. So obviously, I did my internships, and over there, I followed more or less the standard path of doing court internships and law firm internships. But uh, but during the academic year, I did a lot of moot courts and I did publications. I did some a lot of uh, extra courses. And being in NUJS, there were a lot of uh, visiting professors who did courses on subjects like law of the EU, and I would take them. And these. Uh, these kind of pursuits kind of piqued my interest in uh, international law. Uh, and especially, I would say, the moot court competition. So I did uh, the Manfred Lacks uh, moot court competition, uh, which was a space law moot court competition, but broadly international law, as well as uh, the GNLU international uh, trade law uh, moot court competition. So that was, in fact, my first uh, entry or my first exposure uh, to international trade. Then while I was uh, doing uh, the course on EU, uh, because you know there were a lot of practical dimensions to that course, uh, uh, the professor would ask us to kind of see things in the media which interested you uh, relating to the EU. And what interested me back then, uh, which was like very basic at that moment, but it was the stepping stone uh, into the world of trade law for me, uh, was that India and EU at that time, they were negotiating a free trade agreement. I mean, they're still negotiating some uh, seven years later, they have still not signed that free trade agreement. But just following those developments, and I worked on an article after that. So these two pursuits, I would say that piqued my interest in international trade law. And then I got uh, further into it. So what kind of work do you uh, do like international lawyers actually do like you know people have generally an idea about let's say what a corporate lawyer does or uh, what a criminal lawyer does but what does an international lawyer do and especially international trade lawyer I, mean, I suppose it would be very different right uh, so uh, yes an international uh, trade law I mean there are diverse uh, there are diverse paths, so it actually depends where you are. Do you want to? You can be an international lawyer and work in a law firm. So there, I guess you would mostly be doing dispute resolution. So if I come back to the WTO, which is where I worked previously, so the WTO as a law person, uh, you can be uh, in a litigation uh, kind of in uh, trade uh, disputes. Uh, there are three divisions in the WTO which deal with trade disputes. Uh, which are the rules division, the legal affairs division, and the appellate body. But in fact, there are a lot more divisions which law, which does uh, non-dispute resolution. So there's a lot of negotiations, technical assistance, sitting in meetings uh, where uh, you're negotiating policy. So there's a lot of policy work involved as well. So there are both opportunities available as an international lawyer, I would say, to be in dispute resolution side of things as well as to be on more policy or technical assistance, capacity building side of things. So you have a choice between those two. OK, so uh, if you can elaborate a little more on this, that you know, uh, what are the different kind of work? Like, So I understood two things. Like, one, you can work in law firms, where you work yes. most of you the know, arbitrations under free public cases like what cases are these that you are dealing with um so i didn't follow you completely uh because i guess the line got interrupted a bit but i guess uh, the gist of your question is uh, so there's what are the like litigation or law dispute resolution kind yeah, of options sort of matters, what sort of cases that international lawyers deal with like when you say that you know you're dealing with disputes so what sort of disputes are these are these like you know, disputes under free trade agreements or like very various treaties or like you know uh, you know maybe a wto cases what cases are these basically are uh, they yeah. countries usually or between two states and I mean, like what are the who are the parties what sort of matters are these? yeah uh yes so international law i mean there are different kinds of uh, courts in international law so there's icj within uh, the wto you have uh, the dispute settlement body where you have panels as well as the appellate body uh, most of international law is as you mentioned it's between states so it's state states and uh, when you're working for a law firm your law firm will be representing a particular state when you're working at the wto you're working for the secretariat so you're obviously a neutral party. 
uh, you're not working for any of the countries, uh, but you're helping the pa the uh, the judges uh, on the panel or the appellate body members prepare their reports. So it's a lot of uh, legal uh, uh, legal review work, I would guess. But I was not in those divisions. I was in the intellectual property division. But uh, coming back, uh, so yeah, these are mostly state state. There are there is. A some minor branches of international law, uh, such as let's say investment arbitration, where there are uh, state uh, uh, and private party disputes. But I would say if I look at the whole, uh, whole uh, chunk of it, most of uh, cases under international law would be state state disputes, where if you're in a law firm, you're representing a particular country. Okay. And what is the background of the lawyers here usually? Like, where where do they come from? Are they like, you know, uh, we hear that there are many old lawyers who have already established in, like, they're really famous in their country and they come and represent their country in international forums. Or who are these people? Like, you know, what's the usual background? Or are there like young lawyers who are trained to become international lawyers? Uh, yes, I would say there is definitely a mix of both. Again, my exposure to uh, litigation side of things at the WTO was limited because I was more in a uh, division which works uh, in the IP uh, uh, competition policy and government procurement uh, division, so which works uh, more on uh, on policy and technical assistance. But uh, coming back uh, to who are the lawyers in across uh, uh, in the litigation side of things, so it uh, really varies. At least in uh, WTO law, there are particular law firms uh, which uh, specialize, uh, which have a specialized trade law practice. Uh, there are some uh, Indian law firms uh, as well. Uh, so. Uh, there is uh, Lakshmi Kumaran and Sridharan. Uh, uh, there is ELP. There is uh, TPM. So these are uh, Indian law firms which have a significant uh, trade law practice. Uh, they handle trade disputes as well, some of them. Uh, there are a lot of uh, American law firms which have their offices, but they hire uh, lawyers across the range. So obviously, a lot of them are senior lawyers, uh, but some of them are junior lawyers as well. And it's there are positions at the junior level and there are more positions at the junior level i would say but again the junior level here does not mean straight out of law school you would need uh, a, an llm a specialization uh, in uh, trade or international law and you would require maybe some other kind of exposure so the stepping stone would probably be an internship at an international organization like the wto or a traineeship with a law firm okay so uh so it's, it's basically a much longer path than the usual legal landscape here. But you know, so what are the you know the most uh, uh, like the areas? Right? I understand there are certain cities where if you want to practice international law, you have to be in those cities. Is is that so, or are there are certain important pl places in the world where you practice you want to practice international law? Uh, I agree that there is a certain uh, locational uh, advantage that being in certain cities has. I mean, if, if you're thinking of doing your LLM in international law, obviously there are some programs, some universities which are very famous for it. And uh, then there are cities which have universities which are also famous. But in addition uh, to their faculty, their advantage is the fact that they are in cities where a lot of international organizations are located. So you have access to uh, senior officials who often come and give uh, lectures uh, during your LLM or uh, or another masters uh, in these uh, uh, in these uh, organ in these institutes in these cities so specifically it would be geneva which has a lot of uh, international organizations uh, where i am based so it has the wto i would say wipo it has it's the uh, european headquarters of the un it has uh, ilo so all of these organizations the icrc if uh, someone's uh, interested uh, in uh, uh, in uh, human rights, uh, then there's ICRC, there's the UNHCR, which is the UN High Commission for Refugees. There is the International Organization for Migration. So there are lots of international organizations here. Uh, then there is Hague, 
where you have the ICJ, you have the Permanent Court of Arbitration, so you have uh, options in Hague, and I would say one other uh, center for international law kind of would be uh, would be uh, Washington DC, where which is the center of, of IMF, of World Bank, uh, and maybe as well New York. There should there would yeah. that that's the UN headquarters. Yeah. Okay. So these are the places that somebody who wants to practice international law probably should be looking at. It's probably very difficult to practice international law sitting in New Delhi. So uh, now if somebody is really interested... But I wouldn't actually fully agree that it's very difficult. I mean, I think in India, there are, even when you are in India, I think there are things or steps that you can take. Uh, that you can, um, a very common step for students interested in international law, I would say, is uh, internships with the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, and I know they give out uh, a few internships. So uh, uh, internship with the treaties and uh, uh, legal department under the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, for someone who is specifically interested in uh, international trade law, there is the Center for WTO Studies, uh, which is uh, at the IIFT, which is an academic organization, but they do a lot of work uh, in advising the Indian government. So there's the Center for WTO Studies. Yeah. And there's also another uh, new center there which is i think called the center for uh, trade and investment uh, so it has a uh, leading i mean world leading and not just like the leading uh, professionals in india but they are famous uh, uh, in the trade law world uh, who are there and who work on trade issues they advise the government uh, they do a lot of trade uh, policy monitoring review so that's definitely an option if one is in india as well so there are opportunities opening up definitely limited but if one is looking to build a career, there are options. Okay. So, uh, you know, if I am interested in international law, where should I start? Like, I should go and do an LLM perhaps. So apart from, uh, what are the places where I can do an LLM? Uh, so, yeah, I guess it depends where you are. If you are someone who is in law school and you're still not done with your uh, law school, then I guess you could take a couple of steps which would help you for your LLM applications and also subsequently, uh, which I would say is definitely publications uh, in on issues that interest you under international law uh, and moot court competitions. In fact, I think moot court competitions, the international moot court competitions are an excellent way to gain, uh, uh, gain an entrance. You get to know whether you like a subject enough to pursue it. If you don't, if you while doing a moot court competition think that, okay, I just don't like the subject, you don't pursue it, I guess. But it also, so it gives you a feel. Plus, uh, at least in trade law, the ELSA moot court competition, and I know a lot of Indian law schools uh, participate in that, uh, is, is very renowned. And in fact, most uh, students who do internships at the WTO, uh, legal law students who do internships, because internships are open for students from other academic disciplines as well, uh, most of them uh, do ELSA moot court competition, and it looks very good on your CV if you have that. So if you're a law student, definitely start from uh, when you are in law school. But yeah, if you're out of law school, I would say uh, an LLM would be the next step. Uh, and to do an LLM, as I said, you can do an LLM or a master's in international law, which a lot of European uh, universities offer because they are, the LLM is usually one year, but some uh, uh, institutes, so like the Graduate Institute, they offer a master's in international law, which is a two year uh, master's program. Uh, but also there are other centers of uh, uh, international law. So there's uh, Cambridge, uh, there is New York, there's uh, Columbia, uh, uh, there are a few uh, uh, international law uh, programs uh, in uh, Europe. So there's obviously the Graduate Institute, there's the University of uh, Amsterdam, so which have like specific uh, international law specializations. Okay, so what are the considered the three best places to do an international law master's from? <sighs> So that that uh, that uh, is uh, a question that is difficult to answer. I mean, I myself uh, am involved. I did my master's in one, and I'm doing my PhD in another. So it's difficult for me also to make a choice. But um, so I would say again, within international law, because by itself it is such a big field, uh, it makes sense to kind of have an idea about 
which side of international law you want to get into. You may be interested in international human rights law, in international environment law, in international economic law. And in, by international economic law, I mean trade law, investment law, uh, international IP law. So there are uh, different places which are uh, renowned uh, for these different specializations. Uh, in For a general uh, specialization uh, in international law, uh, as I mentioned before, so there's New York, there's Cambridge, there's Columbia. If someone is looking for a trade law uh, specialization specifically, uh, there are two programs that I would uh, recommend looking into. And in fact, most uh, students who uh, do internships at the WTO come from these two institutions, uh, which is uh, the uh, World Trade Institute. It is in Bern in Switzerland. So they have a program called the MILE program, which is a trade, international trade law and economics specialization. So you, in fact, it's a specialization in both law and economics. Uh, and the other is the ILPO program, which is uh, conventionally in uh, Barcelona. They're having a gap year, but it should again start uh, from the next year. So a lot of people who are working in uh, WTO, uh, in fact, are the faculty members of these two institutes. So, uh, so it's a good place to build your network. OK, so, uh, you know, if uh, you know, if I uh, if I do like like usually like your uncles and aunts back home will ask. You know, you said there are a lot of different uh, branches of uh, you know uh, international lo law. Like there's international trade law, economic law, environmental law, everything. So which ones have the maximum career opportunities? <laughs> career scope <laughs> to use the right term <laughs> that is used here. Uh, so again, that's I mean because job opportunities basically. Uh, so again, that's a tough question to answer. I myself am an international economic law person, so I am more aware of international trade law and international IP law. But uh, so it wouldn't, and I know that there are opportunities, but it wouldn't be fair for me to say that there are not any opportunities uh, in uh, international uh, in international human rights law, for example. But one thing to keep in mind is uh, a lot of as I said before, a lot of the entry level uh, positions would be internships or traineeships, and some of them are paid and some of them are non paid. So that could be a consideration. So from what I know, the organizations which offer paid internships or traineeships would be the WTO, uh, the WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization. So uh, the ILO, which is uh, international labor organizations, if you're interested in uh, labor uh, lab in, in labor laws in general, uh, uh, and and some others. So the ones which I the ICRC, uh, but a lot of the other UN organizations, I think their internships are unpaid. As a result of which, they become like really tough uh, for a lot of students from India. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, tell us, uh, like, after your experience in Cambridge, like, what, what are the, like, how does the recruitment process happen? Do you get jobs after your LLM in Cambridge in international law? Or do you have to work it out yourself? How, what happens? Like, how does it work? Uh, yes, that's uh, that's a good question because even I myself didn't know when I was going into the LLM what the opportunities uh, would be. I knew... I knew I basically knew that the university has a good reputation and it had a good reputation in international law. But I guess in uh, most uh, uh, LLM programs uh, and uh, especially at least the European ones, there isn't a day zero concept that we have uh, back in India. So you don't have law firms or other organizations actually coming and uh, hiring people. So it's about you having to reach out more. Obviously, there is a career services, and all of these universities have an excellent career services. And if someone is doing an LLM, I would highly recommend always uh, using your career services to go to them, have your CV uh, uh, vetted through them, and ask them about opportunities. But that's something the initiative is on you. So the career service is there, and you'll have to sign up for their emails and newsletters. But also, you'll have to be more proactive there. They will not be coming to you, especially when you want to get into a field like international law. 
I'll describe how the process worked for me. So I was very clear that I wanted an internship at either WTO, which is what I did, or because I also had an interest apart from international trade in international intellectual property at the WIPO. So from the very beginning, I, I uh, uh, took related courses, obviously, and I spoke to my professors. Uh, and this I didn't do towards the end of the LLM. Towards the very beginning, uh, I spoke to my professors, especially my trade law professor and my international IP law professor. Uh, and usually your professors, when you are at a reputed uh, good university, they know people at international organizations. Uh, so they will be able to recommend you. But you also have to prove yourself. Uh, to your professors first, uh, because I mean, you're there for mostly one year. So it's a short period of time. It's not like a five year uh, law course that you're doing. You don't have too much time. So you have to be very sure, in my opinion, before you enter the LLM, what you would ideally like to do. It should not perhaps be just one option. Maybe you should have a plan B or plan C, but one should have certain ideas and approach it from that point of view. So I went and spoke to my professors. The thesis that I did uh, which was in fact very crucial for getting my WTO internship was uh, on international IP and trade, which and it was about the tobacco plane packaging case, uh, which was uh, really uh, it was the most uh, trending, uh, uh, I would say, topic at that moment. So I did it on that, uh, and uh, I did a good uh, thesis. I spoke to my professors, and they helped put help put me in touch with uh, people uh, from international organizations subsequently. Uh, how the process worked with the internship at the WTS, obviously there is an online application and you fill it out, uh, uh, you fill up the online application form. But usually uh, it also helps if you talk to your professors. It's uh, it's not that it doesn't happen at all. When I was at the WG, I did meet people who came in just to the application process. But it helps to uh, have some rec uh, recommendations from your professors, and they will help you. OK, great. Yeah. And uh, so tell us about your experience at the WTO. You know, you worked there for how long? About a few months, right? Or about a year? Uh, yeah, about one year. So I first did a six month internship and then I did a short term uh, contract there. Uh, so again, the interview process for the WTO, uh, it started, uh, I guess, uh, the month after I graduated uh, from Cambridge. So I was back in India for uh, two months and I was doing a consultancy uh, with, the, uh, with the trade center at the Jindal Law School back then. Uh, and I was uh, so, in, so I was getting some trade law experience. Uh, and I guess within one or two months of graduating from Cambridge, uh, my name uh, was shortlisted uh, for an interview with the uh, with the intellectual property uh, government procurement and competition policy division. So there were two rounds of uh, interview which happened uh, both over the phone, uh, and and then I got uh, the uh, internship. Uh, what I think helped me get the internship, uh, uh, looking back, a was definitely the thesis that I did uh, in uh, my master's program because because it was uh, an IP and trade law uh, thesis. I guess I was chosen by the department. Uh, by the division for which uh, I uh, worked with because of the fact that I worked in an area that they deal with. So it's also, it's not just about the organization. I guess the point is that within the organizations, there are a lot of divisions and it helps to kind of identify which divisions, uh, which divisions you may want to work with. Uh, which are more in align, which are more aligned with your interests, and kind of uh, 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 like prepare your application, uh, specifying that these are the divisions that I would want to work with, uh, even within uh, even within a broad international organization. Uh, so it, it's basically like a law firm, but it has different uh, practices. So you should look at it that way. So just saying I want to work at the WTO or saying I want to work at WIPO may not be enough. You need to be able to show special, a further specialization into the work of one of the divisions. 
And I guess one other thing, because what I was taken on mostly were for uh, research projects uh, and uh, technical assistant uh, programs uh, by the division was was my editorial experience. Uh, I mean, I had never thought that that would matter a lot. But actually, in my interview, they asked a lot about my editorial experience, both at the NUJS Law Review and uh, with the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge uh, International and Comparative uh, Journal. So, I mean, I had not thought that that would be relevant for my W2 internship, but I think it played a crucial role. Interesting. So, yeah. uh, you know, what kind of work did you do actually when you were at the W2? What sort of, uh, you know, uh, projects did you work on? Yeah, so as I mentioned, like at the WTO, I was in a team that does not, uh, that's not a trade uh, uh, disputes team. So I was not involved in disputes. I did uh, more of the other work that the international organization does, uh, which are broadly uh, research projects, so different kind of uh, uh, research undertakings. Uh, that uh, or the division does, as well as a lot of technical assistance and capacity building uh, projects. So by technical assistance and capacity building, uh, what I mean is uh, because international trade and international intellectual uh, property is a very niche field, so a lot of government officials across most countries don't have the specialization uh, on how to implement, let's say, the TRIPS agreement or don't know what it is about. So a lot of the work that the secretariat does is uh, capacity building to uh, help government officials across uh, different countries, uh, help them understand what these agreements actually involve, what kind of changes you may have to do to your domestic law, or let's say what are the competition policy uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, international uh, IP. Uh, so e education, but capacity building and technical assistance. So a lot of programs I assisted in implementing uh, and uh, conducting a lot of such programs. A lot of research uh, publications uh, that uh, the international organization does. So one specific thing that I was uh, involved with was a book which reviews uh, the linkages uh, between uh, competition uh, law and uh, international intellect and intellectual property uh, across different jurisdictions. So I analyzed the linkages uh, for various jurisdictions, including uh, India, Japan, uh, and Korea. OK. So you said that you worked on some capacity building programs. What what was the form? That is like workshops in uh, Geneva or like where these delivered across the world? Like what was it like? Yeah, so I was always Geneva based. So the ones I did was uh, essentially government officials from different countries. And usually these were the developing country members of the WTO. So they sent their delegates uh, from different uh, ministry and they would have, let's say, uh, one or uh, two day or a one week uh, uh, seminar or workshop uh, at the WTO. But in fact, a lot of the work that the WTO does is uh, is um, capital uh, based. So where they send delegations to various uh, uh, to the various uh, capitals of uh, countries and uh, so and and they work there. So it works both ways. Okay, understood. Yeah. So uh, once you like you know you said that you were intern for a while and then you got a short project was it different once you joined on a short project like what uh, no no apart from no the i in fact continued with the same kind of work that i was doing so uh, so apart from the pay like nothing else changed the profile of the work was uh, pretty much the same pretty much yeah I, I continued the work that i was doing yeah right, right. So one important question, like the kind of uh, stipend you get in these internships, is it kind of sufficient to have a comfortable living in these expensive cities? Uh, yes, I would say, I mean, may not be the most comfortable living that someone is uh, uh, would like, but it is definitely sufficient. And, uh, you know, all these cities that I mentioned, which are centers of international law, so cities like uh, Geneva or The Hague, these are expensive cities. Uh, but if you have a paid internship, uh, the remuneration that these organizations give, I would say it's, it's uh, sufficient uh, to live in these cities with that and even save a bit. 
And in fact, if after that you get a, a consultancy project or a short term contract with any of these organizations, then your salary increases quite a bit. Like, uh, uh, and then it's very, very comfortable. But even an internship, I would say the remuneration is definitely enough to survive. Okay, got it. So now after uh, leaving the WTO, what have you you have you joined you decided to do PhD? What is the reason for doing a PhD at this stage? You could have continued to work, right? Uh, yes, I could have uh, probably gotten more uh, short term contracts. But uh, I mean, again, a PhD is also something that I had planned while I was doing the uh, LLM itself. So I mean, I worked for a year in the middle, but uh, so I had one year in between my LLM and PhD, which is when I was mostly at the WTO. But I always knew that I wanted to, I mean, from the time I was doing my LLM, I knew I wanted to do a PhD. Uh, I guess the idea is uh, uh, I do like academia and uh, I would like to have a career in academia someday, uh, but may not be immediately after uh, the PhD itself. But to have uh, my options of working in both academia and be an international trade law consultant, uh, I guess that was my main reason for doing the PhD uh, uh, and uh, to kind of you know, be more of a trade law specialist and to kind of have a niche uh, field, uh, to have kind of have a more niche uh, uh, specialization within trade law. Uh, but uh, also alongside my PhD, I am working as a teaching assistant where I assist on various courses and these courses are taught to master's level students. Uh, and so the work ranges uh, from conducting tutorials and doing actual teaching sessions to some administrative work, of course. So, so I do that. Uh, plus, I am also on the side uh, doing a, 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 a like a consultancy where I write blog posts on on current issues in trade law. So I would say I'm doing a few different things, and doing a PhD actually gives me the flexibility to do different things. And but you know, keep building my specialization in international trade, and you know, more so in digital trade, which is like the path that I've gone down now. Okay. So is your plan to go into academia going forward or are you going to practice like what's the plan? I mean, so uh, I really can't predict, but definitely because it depends a lot on what opportunities open up. But definitely I would like to teach for sure. Uh, it's uh, I mean, I'm a teaching assistant now and a lot of the teaching opportunities that I'm uh, getting currently, it has uh, uh, it has helped me realize that, in fact, I do enjoy teaching a lot. So definitely a career career in academia is something that I'm looking uh, into. But uh, I'm also open uh, uh, to a career being a consultant or working with an international organization. Okay. So, so, yeah. uh, if you can tell us a little more about this link later assignment where you write blog posts to so them. I found that very interesting because, uh, you know, like, in India, lawyers are still waking up to the concept of blogging. Mostly lawyers do not, or law firms do not have serious blog. Some law firms have started their blogs interestingly, but mostly not. So what is your experience in this that, you know, uh, Linklater has a specialized blog in something like international trade law and hires outside writers or like consultants. So can you throw some light on this? Like what is going on here? What's the why would a law firm do that? Uh, so it's I guess uh, when you have uh, a blog, it helps the law firm from their point of view. I mean, you will have to ask them to be to get a more definite answer. But from what I think is, it helps to give uh, uh, it helps them to. Uh, establish their uh, expertise in a particular field especially when it's a niche field and it's it's not a very regular field such as uh, international trade and so i guess the from the point of view of law firms i think it is very useful to have blogs uh, if if you know it's in a niche field that you're trying to get into or, or or even if you're not trying to get into if you're established but if someone just goes online and does a basic google search it is something that shows up so i think having an online presence 
is uh, is of course very important in today's uh, day and age and uh, more and more law firms are waking up to this and i think law firms in india are also gradually i hope uh, you know uh, waking up that uh, it it it's uh, important to have a block uh, to importance to have importance to important to have uh, an online uh, presence uh, so i guess uh, that's where it comes from the law firms point of view uh, i I'm guessing there may have limited capacity in their trade team uh, currently, or uh, maybe it, especially if you want to do regular posts, uh, it would be more difficult. So it hence would make sense for them to hire external consultants. But obviously, it goes through a lot of checks within the firm before something is published, and you know, uh, before uh, a blog is uh, published. So even if I'm an external, it goes through a lot of checks before uh, a blog, po uh, something that I write is published. And it's on every month, it's on a different issue, but on something which is, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, in the news uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, and because it's a UK law firm, something which is of uh, importance to the UK, especially given the fact that they have Brexit going on now, there are a lot of trade law concerns uh, uh, there. So it's uh, it's usually trade uh, issues which have a Brexit uh, dimension. Right. Okay. So uh, what are the best paid jobs in, uh, in uh, international trade law? Uh, so, I mean, uh, well, not everyone discloses their salary, but uh, I, I wouldn't say, I guess once if you have like a contract with an international organization, they are fairly well paid. Uh, and even or if you work with an uh, international uh, uh, international law firm in uh, dispute settlement, obviously most of uh, these law firms are uh, American or European law firms. Uh, so. They, they are very well paid and they have a lot beyond that they have a lot of good work uh, coming uh, because uh, there are very few law firms uh, which have uh, uh, a very established trade practice uh, so these law firms uh, get a lot of good cases uh, so i would say definitely law firms on one side and uh, international organizations another op which, uh, option which may not be that well paid but i'm guessing will be equally rewarding are uh, there are a lot of uh, think tanks uh, which uh, are uh, working on trade law uh, one that i can name of uh, which is based in geneva is a think tank called uh, south center so they do a lot of uh, trade law work they advise a lot of developing countries because a lot of developing countries don't have the capacity to undertake uh, negotiations for themselves. So there are a lot of think tanks which assist them, help them implement uh, different uh, trade uh, uh, agreements, as well as help developing countries develop their negotiating positions for, uh, for, uh, for different uh, negotiations. How easy or difficult would you say is for an Indian lawyer or an Indian law student to make it to an international law career? Like, what are the biggest challenges? One thing I, I think, uh, you know, international law as a uh, area of practice is usually filled with Europeans more than anybody else. And very few people from any other, uh, you know, geographies at all. So, what are the biggest uh, challenges apart from the fact that these are geographic? Like most of the uh, cities where it is being practiced in Europe, apart from that, what else would you say are, you know, like how feasible or easy or difficult or possibility? Yeah, I would definitely say that being an Indian, it has its own uh, challenges. Uh, which, so, and these challenges are probably higher than a lot of. Uh, our European uh, or American uh, counterparts. Mostly, A, as you mentioned, these cities, which are the centers of international law, are based in, uh, in Europe or in the US. Uh, international organizations, there wouldn't be any cap on where they can hire from. So a visa is not an issue. Uh, but it is an issue for any other organization that you're working with. So working with law firms, working with uh, the private sector, working with uh, think tanks, there is obviously a visa impediment. Uh, it's uh, much easier for uh, for them to hire someone from with, for whom they don't need to sponsor a visa. Uh, 
So that is definitely you have to prove yourself that why they need to sponsor your visa because that entails uh, extra extra difficulties for your employer. If you're working for an international organization, then a visa is not an issue. But one thing which is definitely an issue is uh, international organizations try to have a more uh, all-rounded uh, geographic representation based on their membership. Uh, so it helps if you're from a country which is underrepresented or not represented. And being as we are a very big country, it's uh, it's uh, it'll probably never happen that India is an underrepresented or uh, non-represented country in any international organization. So that's definitely a challenge. Having said that, there are a lot of uh, Indians in international organizations. Uh, there are a lot of Indians interning. There are a lot of Indians who get permanent jobs. And there are Indians uh, at a senior level. So it's definitely like there are examples. Uh, but I know that there are challenges, so I wouldn't uh, sugarcoat it and say that it's uh, that it's not there. And one will definitely face it when they in, enter this field. So it's uh, it's uh, better to be prepared for it. Okay. All right. And uh, so we have some questions from uh, our viewers. So I'll take those questions. Yeah. So the first question by Aravind Atithyan is. How did you get placed in WDO? I think you answered this already in the yeah. discussion. So we'll skip this. Aniket Singh is asking, any advice for internships in international law, which would provide more insight for academic insight, insight of the subject? I mean, OK, he's asking, like, is there okay. any internship we can do in international law that will give him like insights into the academic side of international uh I would say, I mean, and you know, I think that's common across uh, all uh, options in law. I mean, it's it's not everything gives you an ac academic insight because it is such a field. So, but I'm not really sure whether you mean in India or uh, or in international organizations abroad. So, in India, as I mentioned, there is uh, the uh, the Ministry of External Affairs, where if you're a law student, you can apply for internships. Uh, the IIFT, where you can apply for internships. If you have uh, graduated, then you can apply for positions. Uh, they have a lot of uh, positions on and off. There is the International Law Institute. So there are uh, definitely some centers uh, where they have uh, international law work and they do good work because they are advising our government in different uh, uh, treaty negotiations and other negotiations. Uh, if you're looking for international organizations, I guess that's I believe, I believe that ISIL, Indian Society of Indian Law, international laws. Yes, I yes, know. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that is, uh, yeah, I think. There it, must be some private yeah. law firms or organizations who also uh, advise the government, I believe. Definitely. Uh, in uh, So that you'll have to do more specific uh, research on uh, what kind and what issue. So as I mentioned, there are some uh, trade law firms uh, which will advise probably the Indian government. Uh, IIFT, the centers of the research centers affiliated with them. I uh, definitely know that there are uh, professionals there. Uh, there is Professor James Nedampara, there's Professor, Pro Professor Abhijit Das, who are there, who are uh, leading advisors for the government of uh, India in uh, trade negotiations, in trade disputes, uh, a lot of uh, monitoring, uh, trade monitoring reports. Uh, so definitely even uh, think tanks are there. All right. OK, so uh, next question from Namit Bafna is asking, which are the best LLM programs? OK, this we have already addressed. I think we've already answered this question. Uh, yeah. Amit Bafna is also asking, does WTO hire from these law schools? Uh, WTO hires from which law school? WTO doesn't, from what you have told, WTO doesn't hire from anywhere. You have to apply, right? Yes, that is an online application, uh, which is uh, there on their website. So it's easy to access. So you apply on it. Uh, and uh, then uh, you know your place. It's it's a rolling application, so uh, you may get uh, called for an interview by a division. Uh, the tips that I would give if you're applying for a WTO internship is to specify which division. So just to not apply blanketly to the WTO, 
but specify which divisions because uh, you know when a, a specific division will ask and will ask for interns and when if you say that okay these are the uh, divisions that i want to work with so let's say if you want to work in dispute resolution so then mentioned appellate body legal affairs or rules division if you let's say want to work in agriculture mention agriculture intellectual property services so mention which divisions in your application and uh, and also keep updating your application often because i feel a lot of times they don't check up if you're filled in the form like six months back so keep uh, making changes and keep uh, keep your form updated so do they consider applications from people who do not have a master degree at all it's very very rare i would say that it's not something i have not seen at all uh, but it's uh, extremely rare i would say 90 percent of the interns or 95 percent of the interns uh, have a master's degree so definitely a master's degree is uh, uh, is almost essential uh, but it's it's very rarely but if you're in law school again as i mentioned things like doing the elsa moot court competition that is helpful because you know if you come to the finals in geneva uh, uh, it helps you get uh, noticed you can start building your network from there and it definitely uh, it's uh, it would ref like you know it would improve your chances what if somebody has done an llm in india and not from any of the international places and they maybe they don't have a specifically international llm also does it still make sense to apply i mean definitely apply uh, there is no harm in uh, applying but i would think like it's from what i have seen of uh, uh, of the indian interns i have uh, the other indian interns it's uh, i would uh, i mean it's sadly no i don't know anyone uh, who did their uh, llm back in uh, india but i mean to have the requisite because it is a prerequisite which you will see when you apply online that you need to have a master's degree so obviously you have you fulfill that checklist but it's in, but unfortunately it's very rare to see someone uh, yeah who's done who have done their llm but definitely i'm not saying you need to go to the most prestigious university you can do it in other places uh, which have uh, specialization in asia in maybe singapore uh, and you have noticed uh, you would you do notice people from other developing countries so it would it may happen so is there any uh, uh, any any international law masters in india at all or is there none at all uh i mean i actually am not uh, very sure of this i'm not uh, the best person to ask um, about uh, international law specializations in india but i would think uh, jindal definitely has uh, some uh, uh, llm specializations in trade i don't know whether they have an llm geared towards it but uh, they have uh, professors who come uh, there uh, then uh, there are uh, yeah but i'm this i'm not too aware of actually so all right so uh we have one more question from aniket singh he's asking any courses which can be done during ug course like during llb for international yeah. trade law like you know any courses that one can do he's asking uh there are uh, i mean obviously in your law school if there is uh, and i know not all law schools the law school i went to nuj did have a course on trade law but actually a lot of law schools i believe do not have a course on trade law uh, there could be uh, diplomas uh, a lot of diplomas are offered by uh, uh, the wto e campus uh, in international IP, they are offered by WIPO. So I would ask one to look into these uh, certificate uh, programs. So definitely, you can uh, if you can do them, they would be useful and they would count in towards uh, building an expertise in uh, trade law. Okay, and also you there may be some summer schools in some cities as well, uh, but I'm not sure if they are in India. Yeah. So mostly publication will help a lot if you are looking to. Uh, you know, get through to good schools as well as basically publication is the way. 
foreign Indian. Yes, or... definitely. I would definitely recommend if something you read in the news, you know, like uh, uh, India is, uh, you know, it's negotiating positions or whatever current trade trends you notice uh, and doesn't always even have to be related to India. But let's say if you're concerned about uh, Trump and his, uh, his uh, uh, tariff measures and if something interests you, I would say research on it, write an article about it. Uh, it would definitely look good. Yeah, on your CV. Okay, so uh, so if uh, you know, like, if uh, somebody is interested in a career in uh, international trade law or even international law in general, so yeah. do you think it helps for them to for some time practice in a local jurisdiction and later uh, do the masters and go, or is it all the same if you do it right right out of college? Uh, I personally think it makes sense to have uh, uh, some years of work experience. Uh, I myself had one and a half. I think ideally two years of work experience, it uh, definitely helps. And why I'm saying this is, uh, you know, if when you're applying for a W2 internship and if everything else is the same, uh, you know, you have uh, good law degrees, you have good LLMs, then your work experience could be a differentiating factor which would count towards the fact, okay, you have worked before. And in fact, some organizations require you to have uh, a couple of years of work experience. Uh, and it depends. Sometimes internships count. So the internships you do during law school will count. But sometimes it does not count. So you need to have proper work experience. And also, I think for oneself to decide what they want, uh, because as I mentioned, you know, there are opportunities in India, I would definitely suggest uh, working at one of these organizations or institutes in India to realize for yourself whether you want to go into this or not. And also it would definitely help later on to have that experience. So I would recommend if you're interested in doing an LLM, having one to two years of work experience. Okay. So according yes. to you, what is the worst thing about working in international law? Like international trade law, like what's the dark side? <laughs> like we know the dark sides of corporate law, criminal law, etc. We have no idea about international law. So, I mean, international law is a lot of times uh, it's bureaucratic, and it's bureaucratic mostly because it's uh, it's I guess government driven. So it it doesn't work at the pace at which uh, the private sector or you know if you're doing an M and A deal, I guess that at the pace at which it works. So you have to be patient. You know things you're negotiating on. Uh, uh, not disputes, but uh, I guess it's not applicable to dispute, but negotiations or processes tend to really extend out. Uh, so, and it's a result of the fact that it's a bureaucratic process. It's very difficult when it's a multilateral, getting a lot of different countries with varying interests to agree on something. So sometimes, you know, you're very passionate about something and you want something to happen, uh, but it just doesn't because countries don't agree. And that's a problem with trade law. I think it's uh, apart from dispute uh, dispute resolution on the negotiation side of things, it's uh, it's been static for a very long while because it's just very difficult to get countries together to agree and negotiate and move forward. So it's it's a very slow process. And obviously, as, as a young professional, it's uh, it's a field where uh, opportunities are few and far between. Not that it's not there and it helps to have your network and keep building your expertise. Uh, but it's not as much as you would have in the private sector. It's not that there are, you know, 50 jobs every year. So it depends. OK, got it. So we have more or less come to the end of our session. Uh, just mm -hmm. a few minutes left, a couple of minutes. So before we go, what would be your you know, final message to the people who are interested in this career? I'm sure they are the people who are watching this, people who want to have a career yeah. in international law, or you know, they are excited at the prospect of it, very interested. So what would be your uh, message to them? Uh, I would say definitely try and develop a niche, see what interests you. International law, I mean, you know, when you're a lawyer, uh, you know, when you're in law school or when you're practicing in India, it seems like a small and it's just one field. But actually, the more you get into it, you realize how broad it is. And there are just a lot of different things. So 
um, it makes sense to, okay, I want to get into international economic law or international human rights or humanitarian law or environment law, have some idea of, of the areas that interest you and build, build yourself towards that. Even if you're working in something very different right now and you have an interest in international law is not that you cannot do anything. You know, I would say start writing uh, blogs or doing publications. So you can do small things even when you're doing something to keep building at it. And then when you feel like you want to take the jump, you can take the jump. You can, you know, um, uh, make the change. And if you're in law school, definitely just explore different subjects. I think five years or if you're in a three year program, it gives you a lot of time. So to not be pigeonholed by the idea of what you want to do, but to explore different topics and to explore different uh, subjects. Because I don't think in any other space, like once you're working, you won't have the freedom to explore as much as you can. So I would say definitely explore different subjects, study different subjects, do different kind of internships, mood, do different activities, which will help you figure out, I guess, what you want. But it's the more you try, the more you will know. Right. So basically your advice is to explore yourself and see what you like, find out really what you are interested in before yeah. jumping into something based on some impressions you have, because once you do it, you may not like it. Exactly. Exactly. So make an informed decision of whatever decision that you take. Yes. So, great. Yeah. I think that was a very informative and really enlightening session. I learned so much about you know about international law. I can't say international law, but how how the uh, industry is like and what kind of opportunities are there. So thank you so much, Nivedita, and we hope to have you back again uh, another day talking about maybe some other thing, uh, maybe specific issues in international law, international IP law, and all of that. But thank you so much for making time for us, and definitely we hope to see you back. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, having me. And, and I hope uh, some of this uh, is uh, useful for some of the listeners out there. Yes, it definitely will be. And all of those who watched it in the end, thank you very much. We hope to uh, see you tomorrow again, 8 to 9 p.m. Uh, we have it every day, the an hour with Logico, every day, 8 to 9 p.m. on weekdays. And on Saturday, we have it from 4 to 5 p.m. So thank you so much for joining us and definitely subscribe uh, to the channel so that you don't miss any of our other interesting videos. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Good night and bye-bye.